Today's home is Benalmadena, Malaga, Spain. Oh, we are going to just, we're just going to have such a community of creepy ass stalkers that are listening to our podcast. Hey, stalkers, I know you're going back through the back catalog and here we are. You got to this episode. I called you out. It's all good. All right. We, we put that there for you, apparently. <laughs> we're talking about prime SEO here. Because because SEO stands for stalk everyone online. For the middle seven and a half hours, this lady in the seat next to me on her cell phone, her alarm goes off every 20 minutes for a minute. It never once woke her up. Every 15, 20 minutes, I hear beep, 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 beep. For a fucking minute. The Pyramids of Giza, which is where we went on the first day, among other places. And those are like a big, hey, look, something's here. In fact. Whatever you imagine when you think of cruising might be both right and wrong. Because cruising isn't one thing. I'm Bill from CruiseHabit.com, and I'm a digital nomad working from ship and shore who loves sharing information to make sure people take the right cruises for them. Follow our adventures, enjoy tip videos, ship tours, and more in print and on our YouTube channel. Just visit CruiseHabit.com BSDN. We even host group cruises where you can cruise with us and get special treatment. Again, that's CruiseHabit.com BSDN or CruiseHabit.com slash Big Sexy whatever you'll remember. World travelers, this is judgmentalist coming at you on what I think is the last episode for airing in the month of May 2024. That's right. Um, I know where I am. I'm back home now. Because it is, well, the digital nomad. So, where is home? Well, guess what? We're going to get into it. We're going to talk about where I've been for the past two weeks, where Big Sexy is calling home today. Here he is, your host, Big Sexy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever this is hitting your ear holes, I hope that it is good. Today's home is Benalmadena, Malaga, Spain. Back in Benalmadena, back on the coast of Spain. I've uh, been here as of this recording for about a week and a half. It's It's been both what I've missed and, and there have only been a couple of mild disappointments, but that has to do with people, not so much uh, the location. But I've really been in settling in and enjoying our, our our time, as it were, and getting back into the swing of things. I love how familiar everything feels now. Uh, as we've been traveling, things feel incredibly familiar. And you know, this is the third time we've been in this apartment uh, and this area. So you know, we're starting to we feel like locals and feel like regulars, which is really really nice. Although it's summertime, so this time around, we are going to be doing the bouncing around again. Like, not like we, in winter, we were in one place for all three months. Uh, this time again, we will be bouncing around for like month to month to month. Uh, try to do a month in one spot, a month in another spot. And uh, we'll actually be back in Toro Molinos uh, next to the bull with the butthole.com. So I'm looking forward to those daily bull picks. Uh, that I used to do. I'm back to doing daily beach picks now, and it's it's really nice to be back. Awesome, you know. Yeah, yeah, I enjoy it. I, I uh, really happy to be here. We've already met some of our our, our digital nomad friends uh, tonight uh, on this recording. We're recording on a weird day. We're recording on a Monday uh, for this episode, but I'll be going to a wine and paint event. Uh, put together by two friends of mine. Shout out to Cami and Asia. Uh, Cami has been on the podcast. Check out her episode, Uncle Monkeys. And by the way, shout out to Cami. She gave me some really good tips on the podcast, some things to look at, some things to consider for the future, things to offer our Patreons. And uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, diving into some of that and seeing how feasible 
those things are. She also recommended that for every the, all the bonus episodes that we put the person's name in the title, which I had done early on, but for the for the other ones that I had just put the episode title, I put their name in the description. She's like, well, I was searching for so-and-so's episode and I couldn't find it. I'm like, oh. She goes, you should put the name in the title. I said, that makes sense. So I just went back through all the bonus episodes and put the names in the title. Oh, we are going to just, like, three years from now, we're just going to have such a community of creepy-ass stalkers that are listening to our podcast because they're going to be trolling somebody. They're going to be digging in, like, ooh, let me find out what I can find out about so-and-so. And among that list of their Google results is going to be this podcast, and then they're going to get sucked in. And through all the bonus episodes and put the names in the title. Oh, we are going to just, like, three years from now, we're just going to have such a community of creepy-ass stalkers that are listening to our podcast. Hey, stalkers, I know you're going back through the back catalog, and here we are. You got to this episode. I've called you out. It's all good, all right? We we put that there for you, apparently. So welcome. Tell a friend. Yeah, welcome. It's hilarious. I, I, I met with our friend Laura, who... Uh, if you recall, her episode title is Conceived in the Theme Park. Yeah. And she let me know that when she Googles her name, that is definitely one of the top Google searches. Yeah. Uh, yep. For her, it's Conceived in the Theme Park. And I said, well, it's about to get worse. Can I put in your name in the title? So so <laughs> we're talking about prime SEO here. Yes. Uh, to, to, to the, oh, and she goes, Apparently, my parents never Google me. Because because SEO stands for stalk everyone online. That's exactly yes, exactly that. Yes. Exactly that. So now now the, all all your stalkers will be able to find you easy. Speaking of stalkers, have you seen Baby Reindeer? No. <laughs> I've been I've been kind of off the grid for two years, two weeks. It feels well, like you know, I, I never know what you know what you may slide in entertainment wise. Uh in in between all the heavy stuff, if you're not just sleeping or drinking or whatever. Yeah, uh, I um who let me tell you the past two weeks have been so jam-packed full. And we'll get into that whenever, but like other than being on an airplane, there was no significant downtime. Like you were saying I talked about how I would be on an adventure with a bunch of people who wouldn't be a-holes and would actually be worth interviewing. And and yes, they were, was there time for it? No. So um, I have made a lot of those contacts and have kind of sown the seeds. So those interviews will be coming because I've got agreements of, Hey, as you know, we're on the same schedule here and this has been damn chat, damn jam packed i can speak today uh, <laughs> jam packed so i would still love to chop it up and do this interview with you and they're like hell yeah me too so th there are going to be a couple of those coming when and eh, you know it's gonna be a scheduling thing but um as everybody gets back and gets settled into their their normal lives if there is such a thing because some of the folks that were on that on that journey were full-time touring performers some of them are are just you know consumers hobbyists right. part-time performers or what have you you know a big yeah. a big gamut of it all some quasi retired um but a, a great group of people an amazing adventure that's for sure yeah i guess if somebody steals your oil then you're pam jacked yeah but otherwise if you're busy you're jam-packed yes either, either either you're busy or your playlist is full. Yeah. I don't know which is worse. It's always good but to have a good playlist as long as it's the song always plays. good to have a full playlist. Yeah, that 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 makes going through life exciting. I tell you, I I have been catching up on podcasts. I'm the exact opposite because of traveling. I'm not traveling, but I, I listen to podcasts when I travel, but also here in Spain, I walk a lot. Yeah, and so traveling back and forth to Benalmada, not to Malaga Central or wherever, pop my ears, pop my ears in, and because you download episodes, don't you? You download yeah. episodes to that device, so you don't need to be connected. Correct. I don't. Ooh, that was that was uh, a, a 
issue when we first got here for the past week or so, uh, we didn't have any data, right? We had, t- we had changed our flo- phone plans to save money while we're in the U.S. because uh, we didn't need it there. Yeah. And uh, we got here and we hadn't changed it back yet. So going outside of the apartment, outside of Wi-Fi, <clears throat> we had zero data. So luckily I did have like have you know certain playlists downloaded uh, certain podcasts downloaded. Uh, but we since uh, changed our plans around. So now that we have uh, uh, outside data, so things are a little bit more back to normal. But uh, it, it was it was a rough week. It was a rough week without it. You know, once you got out, like I, I, you can't communicate. We did find out that we do have uh, international texting, like unlimited international texting. So me and the wife could text folks. And I could text people who uh, weren't being charged internationally texting. I can text them just regularly. But, you know, normally out in the bouth, I use WhatsApp. Um, yeah. Uh, WhatsApp is the go-to uh, communication and did not have access to WhatsApp outside of any place with Wi-Fi. Uh, so what I also started doing was popping into any place along my travels that may have Wi-Fi, getting the Wi-Fi password so that as I go down <laughs> down the street or whatever, oh, to just come through, you send. I, I hit a little. Why oh, not? I, I move to the next spot, right? It's like a message in a bottle, right? But the problem is, I always think about you know messaging somebody or talking to somebody when I'm on the train or I'm in the bus. I'm like, oh, I guess. Well, let me go ahead and message them so that whenever I get to a Wi-Fi, all that will go out at the same time, and they will get the message, so I don't forget. What I wanted to say, because a lot of times I would forget, you know, I, I, I said, I'll wait till I get to Wi Fi to message them. Then when I got to Wi Fi, I forget what I wanted to say, or what I was talking about. Because that's how my brain works. But but if you're using WhatsApp, you could type that message in and hit send, and it floats in the ether of your phone. And then Correct. when it connects, it'll actually send it through, right? Ding, 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 ding. That's what I realized. So now when I think about it, I just text it. Yeah. And then uh, it was hilarious. I, I'd get back from wherever I was into the apartment, and then my phone would with all with all the with all the messages that I had uh, the people that sent me having received the messages that I sent out. Yeah, so good. So let's let's chop it up. Let's get into it. How was Egypt? Egypt was amazing for trying to just encapsulate it into one word i mean we did i mean we had kind of previewed the itinerary we did so so much i mean so much and and we did such a fraction of what exists in egypt and i'm just talking about what they've actually uncovered so far i want to say one of the tour guides that we worked with says that as far as the pharaohs are concerned, that there are still like 60% of them that they have recorded in history that they haven't found their tombs yet, including Cleopatra. They haven't found Cleopatra yet, although they believe that they are close to finding Cleopatra. Which is insane, because uh, you know they've been looking for decades. Of course, yeah. I mean, they, it hasn't been forever since they found King Tut. Yeah, that, King Tut was, was was relatively. I mean, that was the more recent one. Yeah, and I, I I remember when that happened. And it's you know it's funny because when you look at it, the traditionally like you've never been there before, you know nothing about it other than what you were kind of taught in grade school, which was really just surface level stuff. That's you think me. of the pyramids, you think of the pyramids of Giza, which is where we went on the first day, among other places. And those are like a big, hey, look, something's here. In fact, the pyramids that you see, these these kind of rigidly stepped pyramids that from a distance look smooth, when those were originally constructed, apparently they were smooth and they were covered in gold. And of course, as people came through and pillaged, all of that stuff, there was value in that gold. So like there was a kind of a, like a coating that was on it that got chipped away which is why it's back to the original blocks, the way that they were built. Well, Tut's in something called the Valley of the Kings. It's a lot more subtle. It's not so, hey, fuck you. I buried somebody here, you know, like. Right. So it was a little tougher to find. And and it took 
the the expedition that was looking for them specifically like six years to find his actual tomb um that's kind of amazing and the more and more current in which they find things the technology i guess is the right word the 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 methodology mm -hmm. for uncovering these things and excavating these sites so that they maintain more of their original look and feel because all of this stuff was painted and colored back right, in the of course day. but a lot of what you see especially the earlier stuff that they found they did not have the ability to kind of unearth that and maintain that color as well so in the newer stuff you see a lot more of the color than in the the i mean all of it's old but i mean the the more right. newly <laughs> every last so, bit of it so like yes. you go into tut's tomb it is full color it is gorgeous it is brilliant and then in a little acrylic box down there is the actual mummy so that's kind of creepy um <laughs> So, yeah, we, we went and hung out with dead bodies. But, yeah, we did two days in Cairo. And this was all for anybody who does not know. Somehow, maybe maybe you're stalking somebody and this is the first episode in the back, the past, the back catalog that you're digging into somehow randomly. Or maybe you have some sort of interest in Egypt and you stumbled across this or whatever it may be. But this was a, a group excursion trip um retreat as they call it organized by vanishing ink magic and there were about 75 of us including the people from vanishing ink who embarked upon this journey so one of the things that i will say super important if you're ever going to go someplace like this and really i think that that qualifying like this is really some place where you speak none of the the local language and have right. no idea what's going on i highly recommend at least the first time maybe the first couple of times you hire a tour guide through a Absolutely. reputable tour company the tour guides Absolutely. that we worked with and that organization were game changers in so many different factors yeah. Up to the point yeah, where definitely when, get a tour guide. when we got to Cairo, so we flew from Philadelphia to Heathrow. We had about a three hour layover and then we got on the plane to Cairo. And when we got to Cairo, our luggage did not. Oh no. Our luggage did not. And fortunately those tour guide folks were literally there to guide us through that whole process. What had apparently happened you know when you're at the airport and you check your bag over here and then it mysteriously shows up in the airplane that's over there wherever you know fill your own Correct. perspective of where you dropped your bags to check them and where you got on the plane they get loaded onto this little trolley car that drives over and then it gets conveyed up onto onto into the ship the, into the sh plane right well apparently two or more of those trolley cars carrying luggage for our flight from Heathrow to Cairo had a little bit of a collision. Oh no. So trolley two, car accident. Dun, dun, dun. So we're talking about probably 50 to 80 people's worth of luggage that didn't make the trip. Bro, yeah. Look at all the baggage everywhere. There's so much luggage. It was insane at this luggage claim you know because everybody's making a claim to find where their bags are and everything like that right our dude was like give me your passports okay here you go give me your claim tickets that they gave you when you you know when they first you know the claim tickets that they give you uh yeah, the claim give me those he zips through the line as if it didn't exist because it wasn't a line at that point it was just a mob of like mob, yeah. people comes back with a form says fill this out sign here goes back up comes back almost like butter like we didn't do anything because this is a whole angry mob of people all of whom speak right full of pissed off folks multiple different languages because they're not you know obviously there are people who are speaking egyptian arabic because they work there some of them are local some of them are returning home from wherever they were and then there's right. people from all sorts of different countries 
speaking all sorts of different languages, a real shit show. Um, and dude just zipped in, zipped out, boom, done. So the fun thing over the next two days of hopefully getting this luggage while we were still in Cairo, because on day three, we were hopping, the whole group was hopping on an airplane domestically to go to Luxor. We needed to get those bags before then. Otherwise, we weren't getting those bags while we were in Egypt. Ooh. And I, I pop up the, the handy dandy air tags that we have. Find my shit. Right. One of the bags I find sitting there, Terminal 5, Heathrow. Okay. As expected. Right. Then the other tag pops up on the map. Oh, no. In Bavaria. Germany, and I'm like, how the what? hell is bag two in Germany? Yeah, uh, was it on its way to you? I, I'm, I'm anticipating that the airline found the next flight that was traveling from Heathrow to Cairo, and maybe it had a layover in Germany. Oh, it wasn't so in that, the airport. When I zoomed in, it was like in the middle of the nowhere. My assumption at this point in time, because obviously I didn't spend every waking hour, you know, tracking my air tags. And they eventually did just show up. I mean, they got where we needed them to be. Okay. So you, I would say you did get your baggage we back. We did get our bag, to go over to, both to, of them before leaving somewhere. Cairo. Good. I didn't track it intently, but I, I'm, I am assuming because that location was literally in the middle of nowhere in Southern Germany. Like it wasn't like near an airport or some sort of transportation hub or anything right. that made sense because yeah, of course it could it make sense that, Hey, it got popped onto the wrong flight and it ended up in a different country at sitting at an airport. That would make sense. Even if it were at like a UPS FedEx or DHL, like a shipping facility, because it got on right. one of those planes somehow, you know, Errors happen all the time, but it wasn't anywhere near anywhere. Like it was in like countryside or something. So my assumption is that's a glitch, but it consistently showed up over the course of a day in that area. So who knows? Um, moral is, I'd, you know, I'd say, I'd, I'd say they put it on the train and anything's possible, but you yeah, got to understand. I, I was on, I it was German, German imps. Stormed Heathrow, stole your bags, yeah, took it back to Germany, and then the English, uh, they're not Mounties, that's Canadian, whatever the English soldiers Bobbies. with the big furry oh, bodies no. went, no, the soldiers with the big furry hats, yeah, uh, they stormed Germany. This is all clandestine and, and stole all the bags back and then put them on a plane to Cairo. So whatever it yeah. was, the bag showed up two days later before yeah. we left Cairo. I uh, mean, that's the going. The German Imperial. You got to watch out for those German Imperial bag stealers. Let me tell you about Egypt. Everything is cheap. If you're How buying, cheap is it? If you're buying domestic stuff, like so so we're at the four seasons which is like a five star hotel not, not the four seasons lawn care and uh, landscaping organization correct we'll be making an announcement there in the future but not today okay, um, okay got it. The four seasons hotel in cairo super nice place i have no idea what it costs to stay there because we just you know we booked into the whole thing as a package so the right. cost whatever however we're up on Whatever floor has the pool and, you know, there was a gathering there and everything. And they have these different cabanas around the edge of the pool, as a lot of pools do, especially right. in resort type settings. Now, typically you go to a place and I'm not necessarily just talking about Las Vegas, but certainly in Las Vegas. But if you go to the Caribbean and you're going to the, some pool or whatever, you can't just slink into one of these. You've got to pay for them. You've got to reserve them. They're not, you know, there's a process. No you got to rent it. You got to rent, the, rent yeah. the, the, the cabana. Oh, you want to be over here? Okay, cool. Do you want us to bring you menus? Yes, please. So 
we get menus and it, it really took us a few days to realize how inexpensive the food was but we're getting like shareable appetizer plates for like two and three dollars american oh wow what what what's the currency over there in egypt uh, the use? currency is egyptian pounds and egyptian pounds it's like 50 egyptian pounds approximately i think it's like 48 might have been 48 egyptian pounds is a is a u.s dollar so we're gotcha. literally buying appetizers and starters and shareable plates for like 120 Egyptian pounds. We go, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I want to say that we got a bottle of domestic rosé, you know, sparkling wine for something like 800 egyptian pounds oh, so nice. like 16 bucks for a bottle of wine and you know it was basically kind of one of those hey we got a, we got a cabana come on in you know to to friends from the retreat we're making friends getting to know people whatever we're, we're throwing back bottles of you know cheap ass like cheaper than you would expect to be able to go into a, a liquor store and actually buy it retail in the u.s we're getting it served to us in a hotel and this wasn't and, and you think i think of places like the four seasons being five stars high end that these prices are going to be inflated they may have been a little bit because we ended up the very very last night that we were in egypt about eight of us from the retreat went to one of the restaurants at a different hotel that was connected to the airport in cairo we'll get to that at a different time and did a similar type of thing where we're buying a whole bunch of who knows what. Like the guy was like, I'm going to bring you one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these. And then, you know, we are ordering specific things and bottles of wine and whatever. And the guy, it's funny because it was it was me and another guy sitting beside me who as he's like, OK, let me read this back to you. Literally like three things. in, we're both like, um, we're just going to say yes. At the end of what I'm <laughs> just let's just get this party started. We just cut the guy off. Like, I know it's customary for you to recap, but we don't know what we're ordering. So we're just gonna smile and nod. You're you're just saying random, you're making random noises to me right now. Yeah. Yeah. Eight people ordering stuff, multiple bottles of wine, everything like that. The tab comes, the guy at the end of the table grabs it, looks at it, does a double take, shows it to me. To be like, is this what I think it is? And I look down and I do the conversion in my head and I'm like, what, $107 American? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, yeah, well, welcome to Egypt and you're about to leave tomorrow. So um, the eight people going nuts the wow. last night, 100 bucks. That's amazing. You know, then we took all of our, our Egyptian cash currency because everybody had a little bit of something and piled it on top to tip. And the people went nuts because it was a stack probably about two inches thick of tip money. Probably tipped them. We didn't add it up. We didn't care. We were just throwing it in the pile. Probably added up to more money than what the tab was. And they went nuts. So we, we probably own that restaurant now. We don't know it. <laughs> you suddenly get a deed in the mail. <laughs> Sign here. Get an alert. We're going to need you to docu-sign this. So yeah, we I mean we did two days in Cairo and let me tell you, every day felt like if this were everything that we did all week, like stretched out, it would have been a brilliant and amazing trip. Each day was like that involved. So, you know, we went, we flew down to Luxor, then we boarded the Senesta St. George, which is a riverboat cruise ship. Okay. On the Nile? Was it we were on the Nile? On the Nile. Yep. So we cruised from Luxor to Aswan and a bunch of stops in between. So as we would stop almost like your normal excursions on a, on a cruise ship, we would, you know, our tour guide would take us out. We'd hop onto buses. We would go to the different sites that were there, different temples or what have you. Um, a couple of different shops. I mean, the cool thing about, uh, you know, number one, obviously I already talked about the luggage thing and the tour people helping us navigate that. 
they made sure that the restaurants that we were eating in, all the food that we were eating was safe, all the water was clean, that they were using filtered water to make ice, like all of the above. Like, Did you try any new dishes? Uh, all sorts of weird stuff, yeah. And I'll have photos that to unload at some point in time. I'll probably end up dropping those chunk by chunk into the Patreon. Um, so if you see a bunch of different posts over the next couple of weeks, I'll try to categorize them either by location or here's some of the crazy ass food that we ate. Um, right. and, and the desserts, man, they they just make art out of their desserts. I don't know if this is specific to the cruise ship or if it was part of Egyptian culture. I'm not sure, but maybe you have a dozen of one and six of the other. Probably, probably. But yeah, um, but yeah, we saw awesome stuff. Hundreds and hundreds of photos. Eventually, those will start getting, like I said, getting pushed out there. And um, yeah, I highly recommend it. We've already had, we don't know when, but we already had a conversation about, hey, we got to link up with this tour group bring the kids back um, right. because I mean, it's really, it's a lot of the stuff is so breathtaking and um, let me, I'm going to give a shout out uh, to the tour company. That's a good yeah. idea. The company's called high end journeys. Any funny spelling or just like high H I G H H I G H E N D journeys.com. And it looks like a lot of their different experiences include some sort of riverboat cruise on the Nile. And let me tell Shout you. Shout out to High End Journeys. You guys should become sponsors. The the uh, the ships are small. So like when you when you think about a traditional cruise ship, like the you know, the one that you took transatlantic or mm -hmm. for your birthday years ago. I can't imagine that on a river. How many how many decks are those boats? uh usually like 17 15 between 15 and 17 right the carnival ones that we've been on i think were 13 or 14 i think the disney cruise was 13 or 14 four four decks yeah these ships are small four decks you don't get lost on them you don't feel anything you don't feel like you're moving You've got a like there were numerous times in which we I only knew that we were moving because I looked and saw the water moving. Like right. I didn't feel it. It yeah. was crazy. And, uh, I mean, and to be fair, there's not a whole lot of big boat moving wave actions on rivers. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. You tend to you, you tend to feel it if you're going up river, but down river you don't. You just it's just like, you know. Put in let the current take you where it needs to go, and you just have to worry about steering it. See, we were going, we were going opposite. Up river. The, Nile, the Nile flows north, and we were we were going south. We still felt nothing. Um, right. One of the one of the craziest things was somewhere in the south. We went through a lock, and okay. there are so number one. When you're out and about, it's very, very much a, a bartering culture. Like you can buy all sorts of stuff. You can haggle for the pricing and everything like that. Yeah. So at this lock, and this is like a normal thing, as you're approaching the lock, these guys came up on this little rowboat. I mean, literally two people in the boat. And I don't know that you could, you can maybe fit a third. And the boats, our boat's moving pretty slow. This rowboat is moving at whatever pace you would imagine a rowboat moving. And from the upper deck, these guys have all sorts of stuff, clothing and, and scarves and all this other stuff that they're trying to get people up on the upper deck of the boat to buy. Oh, wow. So they're negotiating price and haggling with people, and then they take it and they bag it up and they chuck it up there. Then you take a look at it and examine it and make sure it's, you know, it's good what you want it to be. And then they throw you another bag that's got something in it to weigh it down for you to put your money in and chuck it back down to them. Right. It, it was to some What'd extent, you buy? I didn't buy anything. Um, what do I buy? Uh, it was, it was just, it was a spectacle just to sit back and watch the whole thing kind of transpire. And, 
it just, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, which normally I would be, but other people were taking the lead on it. So I was like, I'm just gonna sit back and enjoy this and, and watch what, watch this all unfold. Um, but yeah, they go through the lock with you, or at least this boat did. And then my assumption is that they camp out on the other side and wait for a boat to come back through Yeah, um, and go back and forth. A and, you know, it's, it's wild. Those are the Loch Ness shoppers. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Your Loch Ness merchants. So yeah, Egypt was, was ridiculously cool. Then we flew back and spent uh, four days in London. And it didn't rain till the third, fourth day. Nice. So we got teased with some some tremendous London weather. And because I, I've looked at it since, and it ra literally rains about somewhere between twenty five percent to a third of the time. And yes, yeah, there's a lot of rain there. Known for that. Yeah. Did so. you get to? Did you uh, did you hook up with what's his face? No, he actually ended up getting there the last full day that we, I mean, we connected, but it just didn't work out time frame. Um, Sebastian Robbins got in and, and it, like Tuesday and we were leaving Wednesday, but Tuesday was the day that we had stacked up with um, like this, this afternoon tea bus shit. and Hamilton. So the with the, that was the rain day also so the traffic okay. getting to and from where we needed to be for that t bus was far more ridiculous than we thought it was going to be i thought i was going to have time to squeeze something in in between and it just there was no reality to that unfortunate so yeah yeah that, we'll that's that's that, that's always tough the the scheduling and the randomness and if you don't have you have to have a couple of days to give some leeway to that but if you're on vacation you tend to plan everything and and put everything together yeah but man uh, uh time moves stupidly fast when you're traveling yeah it just does you know we've already been like i said we've been here for a week and a half and that's insane you know yeah. and then people we want to see people want to get together people want to hook up with like oh man oh you know we'll, we'll work it out we've had you know two mahjongs and one we had to cancel because nobody showed up and the other one uh, only two people showed up and my thoughts are like, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll have them again. But I'm going, but that's two down. It's a, there's a finite number, as it were. You know, we're not here for long term just yet. So uh, it, it puts a little extra weight on it. And I don't, and not everybody has that weight. You know what I mean? Not everybody has that weight uh, to, to meet up or get together or what have you. Uh, oh, I didn't tell you. Uh, oh, I don't know if you saw my, our bonus episode of the, the travel day bonus episodes listeners to the podcast heard about my travels and i put in there most of it was what you want travel wise blissfully uneventful right we got to lax went through security lax easy peasy got to the gate ready to go right, our flight was delayed by two hours uh, so that two hour delay killed the layover we had in Charles de Gaulle. But man, if we didn't run into an issue in Charles de Gaulle, we, we, we finally get over, we have to find out where our gate is, you know, terminal. Again, we've lost the advantage of a layover. So we got to rush over to get through customs, get to the gate. And we get to the gate and the, the flight charges uh my wife not doesn't charge her no but makes her check another bag right so we had you know we already had our two bags checked or the we had one bag checked and our carry-on and personal item we each had that but because we had the dog they made her check one of her additional uh carry-ons okay frustrating before that on the flight over from LAX and it was an overnight flight LAX to France for I'd say the middle seven and a half hours, this lady in the seat next to me on her cell phone, her alarm goes off every 20 minutes for, for a minute. Ugh. You know how alarms do? They'll yeah. snooze for 15, 20 minutes, and then they'll go for a minute, and then it'll automatically snooze for 15 minutes. 
For seven and a half hours, her phone did this. It never once woke her up. So for every every 15, 20 minutes, I hear dee dee dee. 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 For a fucking minute. And then then silence. And then again in 15 minutes. Dee dee dee. Oh, it was maddening. But the problem was at the time I couldn't you couldn't tell exactly whose it was. Huh. Right. And so we kept looking and, and searching and finding and, and trying to figure that out. And it was absolutely fucking frustrating. It was very, very maddening. But we made it. She finally woke up. The it was a woman literally next to me across the aisle. She finally woke up and turned it off about Hour and a half before we had to land. Crazy. Yeah, I was. I was not happy. I was not a happy camper with that aspect. But still made it down. Saw you know a few movies on the flight, and then they like said we're in Charles de Gaulle. Made it to Charles de Gaulle. Got, and that flight was oh, was fine. The three and a half hour. But by that time, but see, we also we couldn't walk Fox. Like we have our dog with us. But we couldn't walk him. He could. He uh, there was no time. That's right. Yeah, yeah. He lost the layover. Right, and so by the time we got in that second leg, he was restless, and so that made it somewhat uncomfortable, you know, because wife had to like have her hand in the. Either one of us had to have our hand in the crate to calm him down to keep him from barking. We finally made it to Malaga. Uh, I, what I didn't realize is that. When you fly internationally, there is an international baggage claim area. Yeah. But we checked a bag in France. So her check bag was in uh, the regular terminal where the luggage are. And, and I don't know about uh, going to this other baggage claim area, right? So because we flew in from France, I, I thought everything would be where it was supposed to be. And it wasn't there, so then I thought we lost our luggage. We did, however, lose a leash um, for Fox. Uh, we actually left it on the plane, and we never have not heard anything back. And they're not going to give us back. So that's why we lost it. So we bought a new one, but I could buy a better one. So it worked out. Again, the Barry White sent the follow up words, which worked out perfectly. But we we got in and then went back and forth to our, our promo. Our, we, reported the lost leash and then had to go back to that booth to ask about the luggage. I thought that we had lost our luggage. I said, nope, you got to go to this terminal. And there, it was there. So we finally, we got our bags in. So I learned something new, uh, listeners. When you travel international, uh, if you go from the U.S. to another country and then from that country to a different country, your bags are going to be in the international baggage claim area versus if you go from the U.S. directly to your travel country, they're just going to send you to that baggage claim area anyway. You won't even realize that it's a different baggage claim than anybody else on the planet. Right. So that was that was new information to me, which uh, I'm glad I know now. I'm glad I understand. I'm glad I learned. And we got back and met up with the. Folks, our friends uh, were able to get up my uh, the luggage that we left here, the bag that we left here. A friend of ours went to pick it up for us and brought it nice. back to us. So shout out to Mike. We appreciate that. And uh, again, shout out to Kelsey. Yes, that Kelsey and uh, Cammy for holding our, our stuff here. And so, yeah, we're back. Yeah. yeah we're uh, contemplating the next trip to London. Well, that's awesome. I can't, I can't wait to hear about it. Hopefully it's when we're in Spain and we're able to to swing over and meet up. Um, as of right now, nothing set in stone, but there is a UK hypnosis conference mid uh, November. So we may try, you know, and, and we're, we're kind of still in this. Let's, let's just unwind and we don't even put everything away yet since getting home. Um, but I kind of was, I planted the seed to basically be like, look, we, we don't need to make any sort of decisions right now, but this thing's happening. So there's kind of an excuse to go out. And then, you know, that's like a two or three day thing. And then we'd just stay in London proper for probably, probably round out a full week. 
um no reason not to we will okay. we will keep everybody posted because i know that we've got some folks that are in that area i've got some other people not just sebastian robbins that were looking to link up while i was out there and the timing just didn't work so it happens that's that's the breaks but yeah fun yeah. times i definitely want to get to spain as well while you're yeah. there I don't know. I feel yeah, like the world. Yeah. And listen, I'll keep you guys posted on uh, the 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 auxiliaries position as as it comes through. Again, both of our applications have been accepted. So now we're just waiting to hear back if we are accepted into the program. So definitely keep you posted on all that. Cool. All right. Well, we got time. We have mail. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm by not request, mail that you reference. So I'm gonna put this on you. I got it. All right. So, um, hold on a second. Listener mail. All right. So this comes from our uh, scoop friend, Chris. Um, and this actually was originally a Facebook post and which uh, they put this whole thing on Facebook. And I said, like, hey, can we shut on the podcast? I'm like, sure. So here it goes. goes. How was your day, Chris? Well, let me tell you. Firstly, there was the whole traveling alone anxiety and dealing with the upset caused by that. Then, whilst on the plane, I logged on to the Wi-Fi. Loads of emails land. Casually flicked through. Oh, the Orleans Hotel. That's where I'm staying. Oh. Oh. Fuck. My room is canceled. I'm at 50,000 feet above the Atlantic Ocean. Luckily, Mira put her Wonder Woman hot pants on and dealt with it for me. And relax, relax, breathe deeply, relax. Pilot announces we have gained time on the way and we will land an hour early. That's Ooh, nice. nice. An hour to relax at LAX, get off the plane to the longest line at customs I have ever seen. One and a half hours. Still, we made up that hour, so that's good. Let's me grab my bag and get across the Terminal 3. Luggage claim. Oh, relax, it's here somewhere. Check again, says the nice man in charge. Nope. Looks at his important-looking clipboard. Ah, Mr. Roberts, your bag is in London still. When you Mm. get to Vegas, they can deal with it for you. Oh, relax, it will be okay. (laughs) Relax. Brisk walk to Terminal 3. Now, being English, I know a thing or two about queuing including the UEU or superfluous. You're goddamn right. The Americans, uh, it appears, tossed this ability into the arbor in Boston, too. What an unruly bunch of miserable bastards they were at TSA. Maybe TSA wouldn't be so dreadful if you all stopped being dreadful. Just a thought. So, another stressful 35 minutes to take my shoes off and let someone stranger let me close at Little Chris. No pat down, disappointedly. Get to the departure gate with 25 minutes to spare. You'll recall first flight was 60 minutes early, so that was lucky or I'd be at LAX still now. Land in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Clear customs in a breeze. Turn phone on. Yeah, the shitty company I switched to last year, there's been nothing but trouble. Avoidplan.com, they suck balls. Don't Doesn't automatically switch signal for you. So no phone or data, which of course means no maps. Glad I've been to the hotel before and know roughly how to get there. Over to collect car. Why is that so far from the airport? Because Las Vegas sucks. That's the editor note. Because Las Vegas fucking sucks in that, in that department. Uh, car rental is the only jam in a fairly flawless airport arrival in Vegas. Get directed towards a nice blue Mustang. It starts, so the key must be in it. Somewhere. But where? Nice lady Enterprise looked at me like I'm stupid. You don't need a key. What if I want to lock it? Can I just leave it and nobody will steal it? I take a gray Mustang. Get to the Orleans Hotel, check in effortlessly. I'm in room number, like I'm going to tell you that. (laughs) It's easy to remember because my dad was born this year. You can say it now. This is past the time. Nobody's going to stalk you anymore. Get on Messenger, pick up a stranger to take to the bucket show. Hi, Nick. Thanks for being my navigator. Meet up with just the best people. Laugh and have fun in pizza. Thanks, Ryer. I was Hank Marvin. Thanks, Matt, Paul, and special guest Jacob for making the end of the day worth all the aggravation of the rest of the day. 
Oh, and Spadoni on the keys. How does he always look so dapper? I have gifts for you all in my suitcase. I apologize to the people. I get a ride back to the hotel. And what I say in the Mustang is four seats is a bit of a stretch. Blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah, blah. Salt pork. And then blah, blah, blah. And that was from Chris Roberts, a.k.a. some kind of scoop name. Yeah. So international travel the opposite direction. That's right. And, um, yeah, those mobs of people that just don't. Fitting, fitting, fitting to have that after me describing the, the atrocities of, of that luggage counter in Egypt. Uh, I could feel the vibe, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I, and, and it's great. It, again, it works both ways. It, traveling just either it sucks or it's okay. You know, very few people go, man, it's great. It's wonderful. Unless they're in first class, unless they got, you know, global entry and TSA check. And those people kind of breeze through. They're like, it's wonderful. Like, fuck you. It's not if you're in economy. Speaking of which, how was your luxury uh, trip over? You got, you you upgraded to the the fancy seats, right? So on the, here's what I learned. It's getting trickier and trickier to determine what is first class because I thought that I booked a first class ticket. I thought you said you booked business class. Um, See, that's where where it gets tricky because they interchange these words and everything like that. So we booked using American Airlines, but the flight was actually run by British Airways out of Philly. And then... um, so we actually got on a BA fl- flight, a BA plane. And, you know, we've got those little, what I call the little sleeper pods where you can put the, right. the, the, the seat all the way back and everything like that. And apparently, according to them, that's just business class. Somewhere yeah. on a plane larger than ours in something even fancier than what we had is what they consider to actually be first class. I don't know that they allow people like me to peek behind that curtain, but I all I know is I had to pay for the Wi-Fi that sucked because Wi-Fi is free if you're in first class, but not where we were. We will ply you with food. We will ply you with alcohol. You can sleep. Here's some blankets and pillows and all the other shit you might want. You can use our little TV monitor. You can hook up to your own, whatever you want. But you're paying 14 pounds for that Wi-Fi, motherfucker. Um, <laughs> so, and it sucked on the way out. It was it was manageable on the way home because we basically had the same flight and the same accommodations on the way back. The flight, so they pulled this bus to move, which I think is pretty common, but I haven't experienced it before. The business class, quote unquote, from Heathrow to Cairo wasn't the traditional two big seats it was just the section in the front where we're not selling the middle seat so you get the same amount of space but it's still three fucking seats so that's a little annoying but whatever who cares um i will say that both the seven hour flight to and from london as well as the five hour flights to and from cairo felt like nothing Oh, that's good. And I didn't even fully sleep on them, but it ju- they, it was it was as smooth sailing as I've ever experienced. Because even like on flights that I do regularly, like six, eight, ten times a year, Vegas and back, that five hours you feel most of that five hours. There's no just right. Zip you have any jet lag? No. That's so weird. It's so weird. And I think part of that was the flight times because we got on a plane leaving Philly at like 6.30 or 7.30 p.m. Okay. And it was delayed, so I don't remember what time we actually left. But you fly through the night and you get there. If you left at 7 p.m., you get there at 7 a.m. the next day. So you're basically waking up because, you you know, you're not going to not sleep, even if you don't sleep well on a plane or, or like for me, I tried to do other stuff. So I, I slept probably about half the time. Um, right. It's an overnighter. 
you get up, you're ready to, for the day. Now, for us on the way there, we hopped on another plane five hours to Cairo, and we were freaking exhausted by the time we got to that hotel. But we just kind of slid because of that time into what time it was supposed to be. And what about when you came back? And when we came back, we left uh, we left London at a flight. Our flight left at 2 p.m. And because of the time travel, time change going west, we landed at like 5. So it was perfect for us to come home, start unloading some stuff, get something to eat. Oh, look, it's time to go to bed. You go to bed at a normal time because you got home mid-afternoon. You wake up the next day, it's almost like nothing ever fucking happened. Like it was crazy. Yeah, jet lag hit us. Uh, hit us pretty hard. It hit my wife a little bit harder, you know, uh, because we, you know, we left LA at a two-hour delay, so it was about 11, 11 p.m. Right, right, and we landed in Charles de Gaulle at about. It was like 5 p.m., 6 p.m., something like that, the next day. Right. Right. And then it's just a three-hour flight from France to Spain. But we land in Spain, it's 11-something p.m. But because we slept on the flight over, like, it's it did get screwy. Yeah. We both were, like, awake until 5 something in the morning till we force ourselves to go to bed. Then, you know, like I normally go to bed at between three and 5 AM normally just on general purposes. Yeah. Yeah. And then wake up between 10 and noon. That's just my schedule. So there's even no time to, to eventually flow back into that. Right. But there was a couple of days and I'm like, this is, I'm, I'm wide awake right now. And it's five, it's past five in the morning. I need to, get in bed and force myself to bed, you know? And of course, wife usually bed by 11 or 12. She has to go be up here later because she works later here. Um, but still, she was up to like five something in the morning. And usually she's up out on the, on the balcony getting her coffee, checking her email and the f- social media or whatever, like around eight or nine in the morning. And it took a while for her to get back to that. She was getting up around 11 noon. You know, struggling. She's like, "Oh man, this is this." Is, it took a minute to get back to that, but we're we're fine now. We're pretty close back to normal, which is lovely. Sweet, sweet. Well, that's it, listen. That's wonderful. That was that was our trips, our travels uh, to Spain and to Egypt. From if you have any questions about that, hit us up on the social medias. We'll be happy to fill in some more details, go into it. Yeah. Shout out again to Chris for your uh, for allowing me to share your Facebook post here. I'm sure other travelers can relate to how tough TSA can be. Also, man, I'm sorry to hear about the the, the fear of the hotel room uh, while you're in the air. I know how how scary that can be, but I'm glad it got taken care of. And I sound like you had a good time at School Fest. Both uh, Judge Mentos and myself were really bummed we couldn't be at School Fest this year. But you know, we'll keep an eye on next year. And, and my hope is that yeah. they announce it, and they usually do with enough lead time that I can make sure that my schedule stays blocked out. And as uh, I figure out, once, once things kind of, you know, th- the f- the future is fluid for right now for for big sexy. Not sure what's to come to play. It all depends on what job we get, you know, where we'll be, all that kind of stuff. But it it was definitely going and the, the high on the priority list. Uh, if we can make it, hopefully we'll have grown so much by then that, you know, be invited guests. That's, that's the goal. All right. And you realize with this, we're going to be 12, epi- we're 12 episodes away from 100. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. So listen, let us know if you want us to do something big for what, for 100 and what you think that should be. Yeah. Yeah. You can check us out, swing on over uh, to any of our methods of uh, communication. The best place to communicate with us actually is on our Patreon uh, if you swing on over to bullwiththebutthole.com. And uh, you can join that Patreon community for free. Or, or you can become a subscriber. That would help us out a lot even, even more. But definitely swing on over there. Join the community. 
and uh, you can communicate with us really quickly there. Of course, any of our social medias, I am at who is Big Sexy or at Big Sexy Nomad. Uh, you can cast Judgmentalist at Psychic Ish. Yep. Is, that's a great, great handle. And yeah, thank you all again for tuning in. And in the meantime. Safe travels.